I also come from a healthcare background, Dr. Furman, and, and I've observed in my clinical practice kind of, you know, over the last sort of uh, 15, 20 years of just observing the female population coming through, uh, you know, and uh, I remember in some of our clinics, what we used to, we used to sort of comment that we would be in the minority, we'd kind of celebrate when we had someone coming through in recent years of a normal BMI. Whereas it used to be the other way around, but actually it was it was it was not the norm to to have you know to sort of be booking women for pregnancy care, um, you know that were thirty BMI or above, you know. Whereas it sort of it started in, in within uh, particularly in London started to become almost like a normal thing then to have to kind of book them in for high risk care, uh, yeah. essentially when they should have been young fit women that could have you know had. So what do you say about the you know? the diet the kind of dietary habits that people are developing um, um that you've seen over the the in your career uh, particularly with the amount of high sugar that people are eating what 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 would you think about this well i don't consider that those things food they're drugs and they act on the brain like an addictive drug and don't forget i'm saying that white flour is a sugar equivalent there's no biochemical difference between a pizza bagel croissant italian bread you know, hamburger roll and eating straight sugar cube right from the jar because it still enters the bloodstream as sugar and white flour products are almost as high glycemic as straight sugar, honey, and maple syrup are. So we, you know, as you know, sugar is a combination of sucrose and fructose and honey might have more fructose and maple syrup might have more sucrose and a guave and coconut sugar has more fructose and less, but it doesn't matter. They all raise triglycerides. They all interfere with liver function. They all stop. They're all addictive to the brain because the they stimulate dopamine cent- centers in the brain and they don't act like a food because the word food means it supplies the, bur- the body with nourishment for cells to function normally. And here we're putting energy into the body And the body can't convert calories from sugar into energy production without cofactors of vitamins and minerals. So the mitochondria can't utilize it well. So it more shunts it to fat storage. And when you do make the little energy you can make from it, it's utilizing your nutrient reserves, making you more depleted and feeling fatigued. So you you get a little bit of temporary energy, and then it leads you feeling more fatigued, and it leads to the accumulation of intramyocellular lipid stores. So it increases triglyceride production, and it, of course, leads to more muscle um, impregnated with fat, like the marbling of the muscle, which then makes people lethargic and not feel like doing anything and inactive, and it leads to obesity. But, but I was also suggesting that the spike of sugar in the bloodstream from these high glycemic carbohydrates also are addictive to the dopaminergic centers in the brain in the same areas where opiates stimulate, and you develop dopamine intolerance or you develop more tolerance for it. So now you don't get the same high anymore. You need more calories and you need more calories just to feel okay. So people aren't satisfied with a normal amount of calories. They don't feel right unless they overeat calories now. So they, you know, I always say half of what we eat feeds our needs and the other half feeds the needs of our doctors. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's it sounds like a joke, but it's really true that, the, that in, in the United States, the average calorie consumption is 3,400 calories a day. We're in rural China, it's 1,600 calories a day. And we're eating approximately double the calories we require. And people aren't satisfied with 1,400, 1,500, 1,600, 1,700 calories a day. They, because they're not, they're nutrient deprived, they're fiber deprived, they don't have the right degree of microbiome. They, they feel like they can't, they, they're wiped out. They feel wiped unless they keep putting food in because the minute they stop overeating, they start to go through into a detoxification process and they start to go through withdrawal just as if they were stopping heroin or cocaine. And they get fatigued and headache and shakes and hangry, which is an anxiety induced low sugar. So it's not the low blood sugar that causes the problem. It's all the biochemical events of detoxification withdrawal that accompany the low blood sugar going down. We should feel fine with our low blood sugar being at baseline. A matter of fact, when you're, you live more, you live in the catabolic phase, when you're not digesting, when your sugar goes to the baseline, that's when the body is healing most effectively and repairing and, be, and, be, and repairing and, and conserving energy. We're not supposed to be eating and feeding our body all, all day and all night. So it's quite, it's a little bit complicated. I know I was speaking a little bit quickly, but I know we, you know, I wanted to give people the overview that this is more, this is a seriously addictive substance 
And white flour products that are so prevalent in the modern world are not food, they're a drug. And they don't, they're not associated with lifespan, they're associated with shortening of human lifespan and increasing risk of chronic disease, including dementia in later life. And they're also linked to depression, that both sugar and commercial baked goods are make you lose brain cells and also cause abnormal neurohormonal connection between the synapses of cells in the brain and increase a person's risk of depression. So much so that even two servings a week of commercial baked goods or fast food doubles your lifetime risk of depression, but it, it happens in a, in a dose dependent manner. And you know, people will say to me, well, that's two servings a week, but most people in America eat 20 servings a week, you know, 30 servings a week, they're eating, how come they're all not depressed? And I'm saying, well, they are actually, they're dysthymic because it makes them lose their passion and happiness quotient. And they just live to be, they just live for their addictive sensation. They work a job. They're not so depressed. They can't get out of bed, but they're somewhat dysthymic from their poor nutrition, which means they're not excited about the world around them. They're living in their narcissistic bubble because when you're an addict, the world is you. You don't really have um, excitement and feelings and emotions for the outside world, for the beauty of the world around you. You don't emote and relate to people as much and care about others as much as as much as you care about meeting your own selfish need to meet your need for addictive substance to stimulate the dopamine centers in your brain. So the the more you're an addict, the more you're involved in your own um, personal stimulation of brain cells, and you become less of the person you were meant to be. And more involved with your own. So you so it does affect people's propensity for anger, their lack of ability to think logically, their lack of creativity, and their lack of having looking forward to waking up every day with passion, excitement, and being and and, and an unlevel and a natural level of happiness. So it does affect people's outlook in life tremendously for this this um these modern diets that are deficient in nutrients.